You've heard how woke ideas have taken over companies and universities. Win this fight! Not many people want to take on these protesters, but this man is eager to do it. Christopher Rufo, a conservative activist who has led the battle against critical race theory. As a reporter, Rufo discovered that critical race theory is being taught in schools, and some teachers are forced to take quote, white privilege training. Documents obtained by a journalist named Christopher F. Rufo. Now Rufo has real power in Florida because Governor DeSantis listened to his ideas on education policy and defunded so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion programs at Florida's public colleges. This is the most significant higher education reform in a half century. DeSantis also made Rufo a trustee of a college. I asked him about that and other controversies. Here's our full interview. You've got this new job now as a trustee of New College, and people hate you. I don't think so. I, I would dispute that. I have certainly some critics, but uh, I think what they hate is a, a kind of fevered uh, hallucination of what I might be. At the New College of Florida's recent student meeting with new board members... <laughs> Tensions are running high. And uh, look, what we've done at New College uh, in in the first you know matter of months was was quite stunning. I understand, um, but what we've done is we 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 fired uh, the university president. Um, uh, we uh, I think facilitated the exit of the university provost. We fired the director of DEI and abolished her entire department. Um, we've now are set to release a new classical liberal arts curriculum that will totally overhaul the curriculum. Um, and we're recruiting, in many cases, different students, students from um, classically liberal, center left, center right and conservative families who don't have an option in the public, edu- who, who rather haven't had an option in the public education system. We're giving them a great place to go and we're creating what is the first publicly funded classical liberal arts college in the United States. New College of Florida has become the new target of Governor Ron DeSantis and his culture war. He thinks that because the school is funded by state taxpayers, the school ought to have a conservative identity, a conservative Christian identity. Do you or has the governor ever said that? No, that's not accurate. Uh, the governor hasn't said that. And I certainly haven't said that, you know, that, that, that exact phrase. What is accurate is that we're transforming New College of Florida into a classical liberal arts college or university. Um, and it'll be the first of its what kind. What does that mean? You're, of- you're going to teach Western values, which favor white Europeans? In, in a sense, yes. I mean, look, the, the fact is, is that uh, uh, the Western tradition is predominantly people from Europe. I mean, that's obvious. The African tradition is predominantly people from Africa. The Asian tradition is predominantly people from Asia. And so as we're teaching the great Western tradition from the Greeks and Romans to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance, to uh, the founding of the United States, to uh, the statesmanship of the Civil War, to uh, the American history in the 20th century, um, you know, we're creating a cohesive narrative and a point of comparison you could you could use for what we're hoping to do with new college is something like uh, Hillsdale College uh, is something like uh, St. John's. But say what the tradition is. It's scientific method, free speech. What are you going to teach? The core curriculum is going to be uh, based on the classical liberal arts model from the past, uh, you know, 2,500 years. You have You're learning how to do rhetoric, logic, politics, philosophy, civics, um, all of those uh, core uh, humanities disciplines. Um, And then we're going to have kids reading the great books. You're going to be reading reading, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, the founders, Lincoln, uh, Frederick Douglass, all of these great books from the Western tradition, from the American tradition. Um, And I think what we're going to get is a balance back to the University of Florida system as a whole. Um, I hope, uh, and I'm very explicit about this, I hope that New College is a very friendly place for conservative families to send their kids, for conservative kids to get an education, Uh, because all of the other universities, again, all of which are much larger than New College, are dominated by DEI ideology, by left-wing race and gender studies, uh, by this kind of postmodern mishmash of kind of boilerplate progressivism. And I think that restoring a sense of balance, a sense of choice, a sense of uh, variety, um, a sense of of fairness, really, 
in the state education system as a whole, establishing new college as something different, very, very important. It's also serving a large market of Florida families that are skeptical of you know, what is really left-wing indoctrination in many public universities. Um, they, they have now an option within the public education system uh, to send their kids where they're going to get a rigorous education. They're going to hear many sides to the issues, but it's going to be rooted in that great tradition and those great books. And then the MSNBC anchor goes on. New reforms for higher education in Florida, ones that will eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've already done that. I mean, we abolished the diversity, equity, and inclusion office uh, altogether. Are you eliminating uh, diversity and inclusion? We are eliminating the DEI bureaucracy in order to achieve real uh, you know, diversity of opinion, diversity of uh, options for Florida families. Uh, we are abandoning equity, that's for sure, in favor of equality. We're treating everyone equally as an individual. We've actually passed a, a, a board resolution uh, eliminating any kind of uh, unfair treatment uh, or disparate treatment based on identity so that everyone that applies to New College, everyone that is involved in any decision making at New College will be judged as an individual regardless of race or sex. Um, and we're actually uh, restoring inclusion because we're including all of those uh, Florida families, all of those faculty, all of those um, uh, uh, ideas and concepts that have been ruthlessly suppressed and excluded from our public universities. And so um, I, I don't like to to say that, you know, we are the real diversity, equity and inclusion. I think those are bankrupted and really uh, poisoned words at this point. Um, I like to think of uh, what we're doing at New College as restoring the classical liberal arts tradition, uh, restoring the great principles of, uh, of freedom and equality uh, as they've been uh, developed in the American context over time, uh, and then bringing uh, uh, the, the voice of the, 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 the citizens of the state of Florida back into the decision making about what happens to our universities and what kind of values that we transmit from one generation to the next. The president of the professor's union it's clearly an attack on free speech in higher education. No, uh, the First Amendment entitles you to free expression as an individual, but it doesn't entitle you to a permanent taxpayer subsidy uh, for the government to, to, to subsidize and promote your speech uh, through government agencies. Uh, just a, a, the, our, our dear friend, uh, the faculty president should um, maybe consider attending law school. The vast majority of you, 90, 95% roughly, Agree with me that there are significant problems here. No. 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 You are the problem. No, you are the problem. No, I, I, I'm not the problem. I'm actually the solution. Um, and uh, unfortunately for the people who are used to left wing domination over public universities, uh, the solution can be uh, perhaps a tad uh, painful in the short term. A student says the new college admissions office has reported students calling to unenroll and request deposit <laughs> refunds as a direct result of your appointment to the board and subsequent inflammatory remarks on social media. Because of you. If these are students who reject classical liberal arts education and they don't want to participate, um, you know, that's fine. I'd be happy for them to find another place. Uh, I would happy to, to, to do whatever I can to facilitate uh, something that is a better education for them. But the reality is that in the next two to three years, I think we're going to have increasing and growing enrollment in new college. Um, and uh, in the meantime, there is going to be a recomposition of the student body. Have you lost students? The numbers aren't out, but I actually think that we're on track um, to have a really kind of recent record high student admissions, despite the fact that we missed uh, the marketing cycle for recruiting students. And so we'll find out in the coming months. But what we are certain of um, is that uh, in, in the medium term, we're positioned for the college to grow, uh, for the college to achieve targets that it has failed to achieve uh, now for, for going back many, many years. There's this woman, Sarah Parker. Am I going to have to worry as a community member that I'm going to have to come down here because students don't feel safe because Proud Boys and Oak are outside with guns? She goes on and on about the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. Say their names! Say their names! Say their names! Say, their names. Say, their names. Say the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers! Say their names! What's that about? Yeah, that, that one kind of took me for a loop. Uh, there are no Proud Boys or Oath Keepers or, or, or even left-wing uh, militias like uh, Antifa and uh, the John Brown Gun Club. 
Uh, I haven't seen any of them on the campus of New College. And uh, certainly, as I told uh, this uh, very impassioned uh, uh, commenter, um, safety is the number one priority. Uh, you know, threats of violence will not be tolerated. I don't know. I, I'm told that she was not connected to the college in any way. She's just a local uh, uh, activist with uh, um, you know very strong opinions. I think what she was trying to do with that is to get me to say proud boys um, and then denounce the proud boys. Uh, I think that was the kind of tactic. I'm really not sure what she was trying to do, but what I told her. I would say right or left, uh, wherever, whatever their is, this is a fact. Look, including, yeah, of course, look, this, this has to be a place for learning, a place for scholarship. And, and, and any threat of violence, any physical intimidation is not going to be welcome. Violence, whether it comes from right-wing militias or left-wing militias, will not be tolerated at New College. Student safety is a number one priority. And luckily, uh, we have great uh, police officers on campus at New College, as well as Sarasota PD and the, the county sheriff's office uh, that have done a great job at, at keeping us all safe. This is a new technique for your opponents to stop you from speaking to raise the issue of danger and then say it's too dangerous, we can't allow you to speak. That's right. Someone sent in a death threat against uh, one of my fellow trustees prior to our initial town hall conversation. And the, the then provost, a woman by the name of Suzanne Sherman, was uh, you know attempting to shut down the event altogether uh, right before it was supposed to commence. We cannot so, put our community at risk. At, the only people at risk here are our us. Guests. We are at risk. risk. Anybody who enters this event at this point is at risk. There are credible threats out there. I overruled her as trustees. We overruled her. Uh, she was very upset about that. We're the board members. We voted. We have two to one. We're not going to let you shut this down. She said that uh, that any kind of threat should be uh, everyone should just shut everything down. We weren't allowed to speak. We weren't allowed to bring ideas to campus. But I overruled her and eventually uh, she she, she uh, resigned from the position. We have to set a better standard than this. We cannot give veto power to anyone who makes an anonymous threat, because what will happen is that they'll make an anonymous threat uh, before anything that they don't like. And so we set a new standard. The police uh, from three, three different departments kept us very safe. There was actually no uh, actionable threat at all. Um, it was a very great discussion. And I'm glad we persevered because we want to have open and free discourse. And I think that we have to be tough. We have to be strong. We have to uh, not cower in the face of threats. Uh, and, and and look, um, these are all, there's, there's risk baked into life. Um, I'm comfortable with the risk. The audience who entered the building was comfortable with the risk. And I think that's a better standard than simply, um, you know, curling up into the fetal position every time someone sends a naughty email. Every time they have the opportunity to change leadership, to change anything, it always is another white male. You're a white male. I'm a white male, uh, you know, that that's certainly true. Um, you know, look, we, we pick the best people, uh, regardless of uh, what they look like. Uh, we judge people on individual merit and we actually have a policy uh, that there can be no discrimination on the basis of race or sex. And our new president, Richard Corcoran, uh, who also is a white male, has done an incredible job. And I think that uh, his accomplishment in the first 60 days um, shows that he was absolutely the right pick. He's raised more money uh, than any president in a similar uh, time frame. Um, he has uh, reformed many of the key departments at New College. He's abolished DEI. He's established some new athletic programs. He's gotten better student amenities. He has achieved budget for uh, facilities improvements. Um, and look, he is absolutely the right person for the job. Uh, I think he's ushering in a new academic program, recruiting new faculty. Um, you know, we actually decided to pay him uh, more than double what we had pay paid the previous president. And that was also, you know, uh, somewhat controversial. But um, I think what with his record of accomplishment, even paying more than double, um, kind of the best deal in education. He's had to do a very difficult job and he's done it you know, better than I think anyone else could have. Another student on MSNBC. We've been hearing words like woke and like critical race theory for years now. I could not tell you what they mean. I literally could not tell you. Like when woke, you mean, you know, practicing basic empathy, like uh, valuing people who are part of your community. What does woke mean to you? 
you can think of woke as as kind of a vernacular word for left wing racial ideology or the basic principles of critical race theory. And it's certainly even in the uh, sense, uh, the kind of philosophical sense, woke means being awakened to critical consciousness which is a Marxist term meaning uh, being aware of your own oppression and then uh, leading revolutionary action against uh, the powers of the oppressor. And so uh, woke does not mean being empathetic or, you know, whatever kind of pseudo therapeutic language uh, our, 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 our friend is using here. Um, it's something a little bit deeper. It's something a little bit uh, different than that. Uh, and I think certainly um, it's an ideology that should not be the governing philosophy of any public university. You have a tough job because they own the language. You get coverage from local TV. The 13-member board voting to eliminate the school's diversity office. The Office of Outreach and Inclusive Excellence. Diversity office. Office of Outreach and Inclusive Excellence. She makes it sound like you're against those things. Yeah, you know, I think that was a problem initially as we waged the kind of public opinion war. But what we've seen is that actually uh, the, the right and have been intimately involved in this process can recapture the language, can shift the language, can change the language, and can assert dominance uh, on a linguistic uh, uh, territory um, simply by not adopting the frame of our opponents and then coming up with language that can go kind of over it, that can transcend it, that can take the moral and and and, uh, and linguistic high ground. And so I think we've done that. And I think most Americans now understand that their DEI bureaucracy, much as you know you would have in, in kind of Soviet times bureaucracies, uh, they say something that sounds very nice, but the actual everyday experience of most people um, is something quite different. And so we're tapping into that uh, intuitive sense. We're tapping into people's experience. And we're really trying to destroy this Orwellian use of language around so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion so that it becomes um, a, a kind of very unpopular word in the same way that you know affirmative action is very unpopular. Uh, even in states like California, uh, where voters have voted overwhelmingly against affirmative action, these very nice words can, can, can be loaded with negative connotations. And so that's some of the work that I've been doing and, and, and enjoy and will continue to do. Your opponents are clearly often unhinged, and I, I don't agree with their arguments, but I worry about things you and DeSantis are doing. It just feels authoritarian on the other side. A teacher cannot teach the 1619 project? It's not allowed in Florida? What teachers cannot teach in K through 12 public schools in the state of Florida is, for example, that one race is inherently superior to another. So you can't teach that, you know, the, a, a white supremacist narrative in which, you know, whites are inherently superior to other racial groups. And you also can't teach, uh, uh, let's say, a black supremacist uh, narrative that teaches that whites are inherently, you know, riddled with guilt, riddled with internalized racial oppression, uh, you know, riddled with other uh, psychological complexes and defects. Um, this strikes me as very uh, wise uh, legislation. You you have public school teachers who are agents of the state. The state sets the curriculum. The state sets restrictions, and you're dealing with a population of minors, children, in some cases, very young children that are compelled to be there in many cases by the government. And so you don't have a free marketplace of ideas. We know from the Supreme Court rulings that the First Amendment standard does not apply in public school classrooms. And then we have impressionable young kids that should not be taught race hatred. They should not be taught pseudoscience. They should not be taught uh, uh, political propaganda. They should not be given pornography. Um, these are very basic standards uh, which have widespread agreement. And what we've done in Florida and other states is simply codify them into law because unfortunately, many teachers, especially in blue states, are teaching racial superiority theory. They're engaging in widespread racial scapegoating and they're injecting pornography into uh, the public school classrooms. And so we're dealing with a real problem that, it, that, it, that unfortunately uh, has, has cropped up in the last couple of years. And these are common sense restrictions that aren't authoritarian. They're simply acknowledging that the state is the authority in the public schools and therefore has 
the responsibility to regulate them in the best interests of kids and their families. Well, why is the state the authority? Why not local school boards? DeSantis imposing it sounds like totalitarianism. Because all 50 states, uh, the state boards of education or, 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 or variations thereof, are already the ultimate authority over the public school system, the state superintendent's office, et cetera. So this is no different. This is the status quo. And I, I just find it really remarkable because you have uh, state educational authorities in California, Oregon, Washington, and Illinois, who are requiring critical race theory concepts and ideologies to be shoved into every classroom in those states. And, and, and yet somehow it's, uh, you know, governors such as Ron DeSantis who are just saying no racial scapegoating, no pornography. These are kind of statewide rules using existing structures of the state boards of education and, and, and the state authority over the curriculum. Um, somehow that is seen as worse, uh, just kind of makes no sense to me. And, you know, look, you can make an argument that the state should have no authority over local curricula. That in fact, it should be delegated to local school boards. I'm amenable to that. I think that would be great. That would be ideal. I would prefer that to the current system. But the fact is that that's not the status quo in any of the 50 states. All of them have a state set curriculum, state set statewide standards. And therefore, um, this is the, the structure that we've all inherited. And it's our responsibility to govern it. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the, the state curriculum standards in a place like California are, are so off the rails that for a time they were uh, hoping to include uh, an exercise in, in, in which uh, students would chant to the Aztec god of human sacrifice to become warriors for social justice. Um, this is something that was tucked into, you know, kind of a 500 page uh, state curriculum document that was working through the California State Department of Education. Uh, I found it. I reported on it. Um, and then at the last minute, the state backed off that specific requirement uh, because of the public embarrassment uh, based on my reporting. But they included a whole host of other awful things. And so they've included um, really the, 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 that critical race theory narrative, that, that, that concept of critical consciousness or woke ideology um, as, as a statewide standard. Uh, and so look, um, I, I view it this way. You have 50 states, their education systems, their curricula should look very different from one another. They should reflect uh, the preferences and priorities and principles of the voters who are selecting legislators to craft these, inst craft these curricula and shape these institutions. And so if Florida voters say, we don't want pornography. We don't want race hatred. We don't want gender pseudoscience in our classrooms. The state has an obligation and a duty to honor the will of voters and to restrict those divisive and abusive pedagogies from K through 12 classrooms. Again, imposing these ideas on kids. And if California voters, again, I disagree, but if they want um, to be pushing trans ideology, if they want uh, teachers to be able to hide gender transition from parents, if they want students to even chant to the Aztec God of human sacrifice. Um, again, I don't like it, uh, but I respect that if that is the democratic uh, will, if that is the, the, the duly, uh, duly passed curriculum standard, they're entitled to it. They get what they vote for. So my neck of the woods, the Northeast, which leans left, maybe those states will ban using my videos in classrooms, as many teachers do now, or they'll ban teaching Milton Friedman in free markets. That's okay. Don't, don't you have to learn about these things to debate whether they're good or bad? I mean, I think that's probably already the status quo in most of these blue states and certainly most of the blue districts. Uh, I, you know, I don't think that Seattle public schools, San Francisco public schools and Boston public schools are are heavy on the Milton Friedman curriculum. There are de facto bans on conservative ideas, conservative authors, conservative leaning content uh, in almost every uh, large uh, school district in the United States. And so, um, you know, this is already the status quo. And so you, we can argue against it. I would personally. Um, but 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 to pretend that this is a kind of equivalence, I think, is just wrong on a factual basis. And you don't worry that in the future, the new Florida governor will just flip these things and require teaching of critical race theory? Look, if they if the Florida voters elect a, a Democrat to the governor's at mansion, if they elect Democrats to the state legislature, almost certainly they will be adopting a new curriculum that pushes 
critical race theory that pushes gender ideology. Um, of course, I worry about that. But that's what democracy is for. That's what politics is for. And there is a mistake in in many kind of right right liberal conservatives have made to imagine that institutions are neutral, to imagine that public schools are a free marketplace of ideas, to have this this idea that is false that all opinions should be should be uh, w- welcomed in and included in the curriculum. Um, that's not only you know practically impossible. There's limited time and limited space, um, but it's also deeply unwise. We've known since uh, Aristotle's uh, politics, uh, his theory on education that. Uh, that 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 education should be oriented towards shaping uh, good citizens. It should be oriented towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. And 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 I just don't think that there's any equivalence between teaching the truth and teaching lies. If you know something is a lie, um, it should not be included. If it, you know, I don't think that we should be teaching Holocaust denial in kindergarten, for example. Um, I think that. Including it is wrong. I think it's unwise. I think it would be awful public policy. And I think it would be morally unacceptable. And so we're left with choices. Um, we have to make these choices. We can't evade these choices. Um, and uh, and I think that uh, conservatives are finally learning that. And, and someone like Ron DeSantis has really uh, led the way. The free speech group FIRE has sued, saying basically no ideas are so abhorrent that they should be banned. They've sued at the university level. Um, saying that there should be no restrictions on classroom teaching. Um, uh, but they have not sued. And in fact, they have said that these bans are 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 likely constitutional completely. And I think they are assuredly constitutional at the K through 12 setting because there are different precedents. Uh, there are different settings, right? Uh, university is dealing with adults. University is dealing with people who voluntarily choose to attend. And a university setting is a place for more uh, open and robust discourse and debate. Whereas a kindergarten classroom is dealing with, you know, five-year-olds, students are compelled to attend by the government. And then it is a a more uh, tightly regulated environment because you can't have a a freewheeling debate with kindergartners. Um, You you certainly can't expose them to pornography. You can't, uh, you know, you can't uh, uh, teach them uh, to, to judge each other on the basis of their race. These are things that shouldn't be happening in kindergarten. Um, even if, let's say, they could be subjected to debate in the higher education sphere. But but the, the problem with an organization like FIRE is that uh, they've adopted a, a kind of amoral philosophy. They view all ideas as as kind of uh, amoral vessels uh, that are that should be treated equally in the public sphere. And so they'll likely defend, let's say, a conservative professor who might have you know pro-life views. But they'll also defend, you know, for example, a professor who's advocating the destigmatization of pedophilia. And so they say, we want to maintain a totally uh, neutral stance towards any ideas, concepts, and ideologies. And this is a problem for no two reasons. No one has a monopoly on truth. Well, I mean, certainly no one has a monopoly on truth, but some people are wrong and some ideas are better than other ideas. I would argue just even for one example, that uh, someone treating the Holocaust as a historical atrocity uh, is a better idea than someone engaging in uh, a historical Holocaust denial. Pseudo uh, uh, activist groups uh, that, that that adopt a, a kind of a myth, that in the, the, they adopt an institutionally neutral position, would treat them as equal, um, you know, uh, on, on both sides of these, these, these debates. But, uh, you know, ideas are not equal. Uh, some ideas are true, some are false. Some ideas are morally good. Some ideas are morally bad. Some ideas are beautiful. Some ideas are ugly or hideous. Uh, and so, A, first of all, um, uh, as a matter of, 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 of simple uh, truth, um, we should not be treating all ideas equally. Uh, that, 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 that is, we should be treating people equally as individuals through kind of uh, due process and other, and other equal uh, uh, government uh, uh, processes. But, um, you know, we should prioritize ideas that are true, good, and beautiful over ideas that are false, bad, and ugly. Uh, this should be this should be a common sense thing, if, even in higher education. But the second problem, and a more kind of practical problem, is that um, the defense uh, of institutional neutrality that organizations like Fire engage in um, takes the status quo as if it were neutral. 
But what we have is actually a status quo in which left-leaning activists and ideologues are totally dominating higher education. You have many academic departments that are 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 50 to 1, even 100 to 1, liberal to conservative faculty. Administrators are even more left-wing than professors. And then, as I've shown with the DEI bureaucracies, uh, even public universities have transformed themselves not towards the pursuit of truth, but towards the pursuit of left-wing partisan activism. Are you a conservative? I think that I am, but but maybe with some caveats. Um, you know, uh, I'm not a libertarian conservative. Um, um, I'm not uh, necessarily a conservative uh, in the mold of uh, just slowing down change and preserving institutions. Um, because I, I, in, in the work that I've done, I've seen very clearly, and even in my own life experience, is that um, when you have a status quo that is saturated and captured ideologically by left-wing activists or left-wing um, uh, ideas, um, you know you, you can't simply manage them. So, for example, even public universities, if public universities are devoting thousands of staff members to pursue partisan political activism, it's not a matter of simply trimming it down around the edges or conserving you know, some kind of hidden, hidden core of the university. Uh, you actually have to then wage proactive war against these institutions. And you actually have to be a much more aggressive and active reformer um, in order to get to anything resembling uh, those bedrock conservative principles. And so I, I'm in this bizarre position of being a, a conservative who is a, a much more activist and reformist and aggressive, um, uh, it, demanding significant wide-scale public policy changes in the interest of getting to uh, maybe more classically liberal or classically uh, conservative uh, social uh, uh, status quo. Institutions like FIRE, which maybe have good intentions, um, end up actually reinforcing and protecting the status quo that is very uh, left-wing and not neutral at all. And so from a practical matter, as well as a philosophical matter, I, I think this is a totally terrible way of looking at things. Uh, and in fact, any conservative donor, certainly, that give money to an organization like FIRE should stop doing so. Uh, they're not conservative in any way. And in fact, they're protecting left-wing hegemony uh, in practice. I should interrupt here to say, I don't agree with Rufo about FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights. I donate to FIRE because they fight for free speech for all Americans. Rufo, by contrast, is a conservative activist who wants government-funded schools to promote ideas he supports. He wasn't always such an activist. He used to make films for PBS about things like poverty. I spent five years exploring this lost American interior. I thought I'd be telling an economic story, but over time I discovered there's a deeper human crisis. You got into this doing a PBS film about poverty that taught you what? It taught me that uh, many of the narratives and theories that I had relied on as a younger person uh, collapsed in the face of reality. In fact, uh, the poverty problem in the United States is not a purely economic matter, but a social, cultural, interpersonal, psychological problem that was much deeper than the simple, you know, Lyndon Johnson war on poverty narrative that I had uh, received uh, up until I started to actually question it and think more deeply about it. And theories that collapse, theories like what? The theory that poverty is the problem of production and distribution of income. Uh, that actually turned out not to be the case at all. And in fact, uh, there are many countries that are much poorer than the United States uh, that don't have the depth and severity of social pathologies that we have. Give a couple examples of countries that are poor but don't have the poverty problems. I'm an Italian citizen as well as American citizens. Any countries in Southern or Central Europe are much poorer on a kind of GDP per capita basis than the United States. And yet you don't see uh, the, the extremely high rates of broken homes, high rates of uh, drug addiction, high rates of uh, uh, suicide and other forms of violence against others. Poverty is not reducible to cash. Uh, it, it, in practice, it's much more complex than that. And in Italy, say, they don't tell poor people they are victims. They spend less on poor people. 
What's the difference? It's complicated. The United States spends more per capita on means-tested anti-poverty programs than Italy. Although, of course, Italy has a larger state bureaucracy. It has you know, uh, so- socialized healthcare, socialized education system. Um, it's, it's a more bureaucratic society. But the difference isn't actually necessarily just policy. The difference is uh, social questions. Italians still have a very functioning... Uh, um, organic social safety net, meaning they have strong family communities, they have stronger uh, local communities, they have stronger uh, kind of non-governmental or non-state uh, social bonds. And so what you would see in the United States is that if you are at the bottom of the kind of class and economic system, you might end up on the streets you know, uh, uh, you know, doing heroin or fentanyl, sleeping in a tent on the side of the road. Um, and you don't see that in a country like Italy, um, I think largely because even people that suffer from conditions of mental illness, it expresses itself quite differently. And those social factors buffer in some of the worst expressions that unfortunately the United States are seem to be encouraged and, and, and enabled. In the United States, we told poor people that if there were two parents in the house, the check might be cut off. That doesn't happen in Italy? Yeah, that's right. And and if you look at you know, even other European countries in recent years, I uh, just spent uh, six weeks in Hungary doing a visiting fellowship and learning more about the policy in that country. And you know, Hungary has about a quarter of the GDP per capita of the United States, meaning it's you know 75% poorer on a on a comparative basis. Um, but they have a really functioning civic and social culture and their policy, their family policy, how they subsidize family creation actually incentivizes marriage, incentivizes two parents in the household, incentivizes having kids uh, within these healthier structures. And so um, these are all policy choices in the United States. Unfortunately, I think the uh, best and the brightest uh, so-called uh, in the 1960s had good intentions, but they ended up doing these policies that were catastrophic because of the unintended consequences. And European countries, I think, are actually learning from this and in some ways uh, adapt or adjusting and reforming their their social policies uh, in a way that is much better than what we have left over from the 1960s in the United States. And then you started researching homelessness on the West Coast. You see some of the wealthiest cities in the United States and really in the world, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And yet you have entire neighborhoods that are overrun with thousands of people sleeping on the streets, sleeping in tents, sleeping in broken down RVs um, uh, in the most nightmarish conditions imaginable. I mean, really, sub third world conditions, they spend an inordinate amount of money in, in some estimates, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year per person who's living uh, on the street. And the problem seems to just get worse and worse and worse. And so policymakers, despite virtually unlimited budget, uh, have not only failed to reverse the trend, but actually accelerated the trend, leaving these cities, uh, in a state of disaster. Most of us know about that now. What's new is that you started getting leaks from officials. What's new is that, you know, certainly, especially after 2020, with the COVID lockdowns, with the George Floyd riots, um, all of our institutions suddenly started adopting, uh, you know, what we now think of as the critical race theory narrative, that the United States was a systemically racist country and that all social problems uh, in which there was a disparate uh, outcome based on racial categories were the result of discrimination, systemic racism. What I started receiving was public officials and you know even you know mid-level bureaucrats so exasperated w- with what was happening in West Coast cities and then really all of our public institutions, they started feeding me documents of the most political and ideological kind and to to try to help me understand, why our institutions were failing to address the problems and to just even show me that they've been uh, really captured by these left-wing ideological narratives. Including things like, are white employees speaking too much? That's probably internalized racial superiority. Speaking too little? That's oppression too, because silence is violence. In in a sense, it seems contradictory, right? Um, 
Uh, if you're white and you speak too much, it's racist. If you're white and you speak too little, it's racist. Um, but the intention is not to achieve a logical and consistent policy. The intention is to have a, an emotional lever against you, no matter what you do. So it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's designed as a form of manipulation. And so if you can make people feel uneasy, whatever behavior they adapt, uh, and then dangle in front of them the politically correct solution, well, you have to say this, you have to say it in this way, and you have to then shut up after you've said it and delegate your moral thinking to others, um, you find that you have a lot of control and power within these bureaucracies. And so that's one example of literally thousands of examples that people had sent me over the past few years, where this new racial orthodoxy is reshaping policy from within, again, outside of any democratic consent, outside of any legislative imperative, but really bureaucrats that have taken it upon themselves to reorganize thinking and then to use these struggle sessions uh, in the guise of diversity training uh, in order to really inflict their will on others and reshape public policy uh, from within the bureaucracy. What's in it for them? Why do it? What's in it for them is um, career advancement. Uh, anyone in a large bureaucracy, public or private, knows that diversity, equity, and inclusion, or having the right uh, uh, ancestry or sexual orientation is a surefire way to get that next promotion, to get noticed, to get included uh, in a leadership council or role. Um, but there's also something that is a more intangible benefit. It's the benefit of social status and prestige and then cultural and emotional power over others. I found that in many cases, um, the people who are preaching tolerance, inclusion, compassion, are actually using those as weapons and shields uh, to, 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 to actually implement a more uh, control-oriented vision, to actually wield power over others, to sh use shame, guilt, uh, and, and other uh, dark emotions uh, in order to wield power from within these bureaucracies. And, you know, unfortunately, it's very successful. Um, all, all of these folks are are, are terrified of uh, committing a faux pas or committing um, a, a violation of this new racial and sexual orthodoxy. And so people who are more, let's say, conservative thinking or even kind of center left thinking uh, have learned to simply shut up uh, because if you transgress this new ideology that has taken over all of our institutions, uh, you're putting yourself at grave uh, reputational and even financial risk. Your critics say you're just making most of this stuff up. You Think made up it, your you, own you, thing, bro. You made, my friend, you made up your own thing. The New Yorker did a big profile on you and titled it the conservative who invented the conflict over critical race theory. You invented this. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I would say, you know, I, I, I discovered it and I'm a combatant in the conflict. But the the accusation that I'm making this stuff up is is really one of the most bizarre, one of the most brazen lies, uh, because in contradiction to many of my many of my um, uh, colleagues in the more mainstream or left leaning media, corporate media, I actually post all of the original source documents for every one of my stories. And so sometimes it's 20 pages, sometimes it's 500 pages, but I make sure to post right in the bottom of the article, a PDF with all of the original source documents, videos, links, text, uh, conversations, whatever it is that I'm reporting, it's always 100% substantiated by hard documentary evidence that has never been contested. Never once has any have any of these institutions said, well, that document is not authentic. It's not real. It's not what we meant. Um, so I, I've proven with, again, source document reporting all of these claims. And I think that it's so um, it's so embarrassing for my opponents. It's so shameful when it's exposed to the sunlight that they've engaged in these accusations as a form of denial. They can't grapple with the fact that it's true, so they pretend that it's not true and they hope that it goes away. But it's not going to go away. Um, in fact, it's actually expanding rapidly uh, in all of our sectors, education, healthcare, government, uh, corporations. And so eventually, and I think this is happening really certainly in the last year, they've stopped for the most part saying that, that this is not true or it's not happening. 
Um, and either they've backed away from it or they said, well, actually it's happening and it's good that it's happening. So the debate has shifted. Um, and I think that even my even my most uh, vociferous critics would now admit that uh, the stories that I've published are all 100 percent true. They're 100 percent happening, whether or not they would defend it on the substance. And back up a bit and talk about how it built. You got these emails from the Seattle Police Department, from judges, Department of Corrections, um, and you tweeted it and you got some replies. And then what happened? Yeah, once I started this line of reporting, it really kind of snowballed uh, in a in an organic way, especially using social media. So I did you know one story, and then I'd get you know five or six people sending me documents that I might package into another story, and then suddenly it was a hundred people and a thousand people, and then as these stories really picked up steam, you know, first on Twitter, then in uh, publications such as. City Journal or the New York Post or the Wall Street Journal, and then on cable television, on mostly Fox, but also MSNBC and CNN as the narrative started building. You know, over the course of it, I think I gained around 5,000 different sources sending me documents from all sorts of institutions. Of course, not all of them were newsworthy. Some of them were, you know, trivial or some of them were, you know, not quite enough to make a, a news story, but many of them were. And in fact, I was only able to do the reporting, verification, uh, fact checking, and then the writing for a small number of the sources that contacted me with documents. And so um, the, the picture that's painted from this is that these are not isolated incidents, but in fact, this is the mainstream uh, in almost all of our institutions. And one of the kind of most mind boggling series of reports that I did was in Fortune 100 companies, these are the great bastions of American capitalism. But in fact, the ideology inside these companies is a left-wing racialist narrative or a kind of activist, uh, uh, a queer theory-based narrative. What does racialist mean? Racialist in the sense of a, uh, a left-wing narrative on race. Uh, again, the kind of basic idea from critical race theory, the United States is systemically racist, all disparities can be can be attributed to discrimination and we need so-called anti-racist discrimination treating people unequally as individuals in order to equalize group outcomes those are the three basic components of this narrative and even corporations even banks you know bank of america has adopted this narrative um and so um you you kind of look at it and you say wait a minute uh, these are profit seeking enterprises that have embraced a in some cases, a racial Marxist narrative uh, in-house and in their marketing and communications. Every big company now has a DEI office and diversity, equity, inclusion sounds good. That's true. I did a, a report and I confirmed that all 100 of the Fortune 100 companies have DEI bureaucracies, you know, so it is universal among the large companies in the United States. And you know, I think a lot of this stuff is well intentioned. CEOs see across their desk, you know, for two minutes, a memo that says diversity, equity, inclusion. Oh, that sounds great. Let's do it. But what you have to understand is that this is a linguistic shell game. It's a form of uh, uh, hide the ball. And diversity actually means um, judging people not on the basis of their individual strengths and weaknesses, but on the basis of their group identity. And then uh, awarding uh, benefits and punishments uh, in a collective manner on the basis of race and sexuality most predominantly in order to equalize group outcomes, regardless of merit, regardless of performance, regardless of individual character. That's what that's what equity means, right? Equity means the forcible um, uh, uh, distribution of benefits and punishments on the basis of group identity. And inclusion is really the worst of all. Um, it means inclusion of left-wing ideas, concepts, and priorities, um, and then excluding uh, anything that might be a kind of center-left center, center left even, or, or certainly center-right. And so people who represent the wrong uh, skin color, the wrong sexual orientation, are excluded in favor of others who are in a favored category. And then even ideas. I'd like to maybe have our corporate employees listening to the interview try and experiment. They should bring a, um, a, a kind of trans pride flag into the office and hang it uh, on, on in the hallway, see what happens. And then they should also bring a, a, a MAGA hat 
uh, or a MAGA flag into the office and hang it on the same hallway and see what the reaction is from from management and executives. But you know, we we have a, a cultural problem in which, in virtually all of our institutions, it's seen as second nature to, for example, endorse Black Lives Matter, a left wing kind of racial activist organization. Uh, that was responsible for uh, rioting, violence, death, destruction in the summer of 2020. But if you were to say, you know, I'm pro-life and I want to have a a pro-life message in a corporate setting, or let's say a pro-Second Amendment message in a corporate setting, um, it would be shut down immediately. You would certainly uh, be at risk of of ostracization, maybe even lose your job. And the question is, well, why is that? Um, You know, why are only one set of uh, narratives and political ideologies allowed in not only the public sphere, but also the private sphere. Because America's history of slavery and oppression is just so bad. I guess that's the justification. But but in fact, you know, of course, that's also based on a lie. Of course, slavery is an abominable uh, historical legacy in the United States and virtually every other uh, civilization throughout uh, the history of the world. But the, the record of the United States on on slavery um, on a comparative basis is much better uh, than almost anywhere else. A couple of European nations might be able to compete uh, who has the best record. Um, but, you know, it, it's very short sighted. It, it lacks a, a historical understanding. It certainly lacks any comparative uh, analysis or contextualization. Uh, and yet it's bought hook, line and sinker that the United States was you know, founded in 1619, uh, not founded in 1776. I I don't think a careful historical look, again, not minimizing the horrible uh, uh, brutalities and uh, and abominations of slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, et cetera. Um, You know, I I, I think it just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And in fact, the United States, I I think the most honest way of looking at it um, is a kind of complex history in which there are both, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's both evil and 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 moral goodness. Uh, there's both um, uh, slavery and the fight for freedom. And so I, I would like to see personally, uh, both in, let's say, the K through 12 curriculum and, and college coursework, and also in companies, uh, a, a, a wider debate, a more robust debate, uh, a, a more civically minded debate in which a variety of perspectives are 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 embraced. Um, but that fundamentally um, uh, judges the United States on 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 the basis of fairness, on the basis of good analysis, um, and and on the basis of understanding our historical uh, uh, progression over the last 250 years um, in the correct way. Which would include the fact that the United States was the rare country that fought to get rid of slavery. Yeah, that's 100 percent right. And 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 even the founders. You know, the idea is that the founders were. You know, they fought the revolution to protect slavery. That was one of the claims in the 1619 Project, which is, you know, kind of so mind boggling that even the Marxist historians, um, you know, debunked it and said this is absolutely preposterous. This is ahistorical nonsense. Um, But in fact, the founders were very conscious and very aware of the fact that slavery was evil. Um, They had inherited the system of slavery. Um, They were born into this system. But they were making uh, plans, and then even a few years after the Declaration of Independence, started abolishing sla- slavery and in the northern states, started passing legislation to slowly uh, squeeze it out. And then, of course, they were unable to do so um, in their lifetime. But uh, Abraham Lincoln fought and, and, again, sacrificing hundreds of thousands of lives uh, for the great cause of abolition. Um, and, and this was you know, driven by... Uh, uh, Americans, uh, 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 driven by, in in many cases, uh, Christians. Uh, the abolitionist movement, of course, was the outgrowth of predominantly um, uh, uh, Christian communities and Christian uh, belief systems that all were created equal under God. And so I think we have a, a story to tell um, that would, at, at the very least, uh, provide a counterbalance to some of the narratives uh, that we see in uh, are certainly our academic institutions, but also bizarrely in our uh, private sector institutions. Going to modern times, tell what you found at the University of Texas. They set out a, a recommended language guide, and they said, you should be using these politically correct words. I mean, all of the words from critical race theory and academic 
queer theory. And one of the kind of most amazing that I found was they recognized using the word women spelled W-I-M-M-I-N in order to not use the word men as a part of the word women. Um, I mean, th these are like the, in, in some sense, funny, ironic, humorous, uh, but in another sense, very serious. I mean, what are these people doing uh, to the point where they have time to be policing language and replacing words with total absurdities? Um, we, we certainly have a bureaucracy problem uh, as well as an ideology problem at these institutions. What they've done is they've uh, created these large bureaucracies, sometimes involving hundreds of people, even thousands of people across the various academic departments and administrative units that are pushing left-wing activism uh, under the guise of uh, DEI programming. And this is, you know, part of the, they, they use like psychological reconditioning programs, white privilege trainings, white fragility trainings, you know, unconscious bias trainings that are scientifically unsupportable. Um, and they make it explicit at University of Texas, at Texas A&M, at the University of Florida. Their goal is to use public dollars at taxpayer funded state universities um, in non-academic bureaucratic roles to train students to become left-wing activists. University in Florida, public university, was even training students on how to participate in violent left-wing protests, um, how to really go to the mat for BLM, for Me Too, for pro-abortion organizations. Um, they've figured out this really remarkable um, uh, grift. They take public dollars from conservative voters and they um, uh, use it to fight uh, very left-wing partisan ideological fights against the priorities and principles and beliefs of those voters. Um, it's this uh, really remarkable problem that has been unfortunately allowed in many states, but we've just had the state of Florida abolish it. And I think the state of Texas is poised to do so as well. Sandia National Laboratories. These people design our nuclear weapons. Now they have diverse interview requirements. At least one qualified woman and a qualified minority must be interviewed. Sounds fair. Make up for past discrimination. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, Sandia actually is, and it's much worse than that. I mean, I, I think setting uh, race and sex quotas is wrong. I mean, certainly you should be open to and encouraging a wide variety of people to apply to jobs. You should interview everyone uh, fairly. But at the end of the day, when we're talking especially about uh, nuclear weapons, you need to have the most capable individuals regardless of race or sex. And so even if you accept, and, and I accept this, a, a, a historical legacy of, let's say, racism, uh, for example, um, which is undoubtedly true and I think actually does have an ongoing impact on educational attainment, for one example. The, the, pro the, the, the solution is to improve the pipeline, not to push people into jobs designing nuclear weapons that aren't the most qualified on an individual basis. But the Sandia Laboratory was really a kind of un incredible story. They, were, they ran, uh, in one case, a white male re-education camp in which they sent white male executives working on you know, projects, including you know, nuclear weapons, to a three-day camp where they had to atone for their white privilege, atone for their heterosexual privilege, atone for their male privilege, and even write letters of apology to imaginary women and people of color, um, apologizing for how they were born. And so it's not only a waste of money. Of course, the laboratory receives you know, large sums of taxpayer money, although it's technically independent. Um, it, it's really shocking that you would be, uh, you know, uh, putting people through uh, these 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 psychological conditioning programs that provide no benefit on a technical basis, no benefit on a social basis. They're really just used to degrade people. And I felt really awful just reading the documents for that particular training, because you can imagine these guys, you know, 45, 50, highly accomplished engineers um, sitting through this stuff that. Um, I know, you know, for a fact that most of them reject, but they privately have to agree to, they have to grumble, they have to apologize, they have to, uh, you know, kind of degrade themselves publicly. Um, and, and this kind of thing is happening, unfortunately, all over the country. You've written a book about some of this, America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Everything? 
It does seem like they dominate yes. the culture utterly. That's certainly true. But if you look at the institutional uh, landscape of the United States, I think it's accurate to say everything because if you look at K through 12, that is fully dominated by left-wing ideology. Um, if you look at the higher education system, that was probably the first to go, fully captured. Um, if you look at the federal government, I mean, many departments have, you know, a, a 10 to or, you know, 90% to 10% of right uh, composition uh, at justice and by EPA, uh, education, many other, uh, many other government departments. Um, and if you look at even corporations, uh, left-wing ideas are pushed at the highest levels while uh, conservative ideas are systematically excluded. And so certainly as a matter of elite culture, um, it is totally dominated by the left across the institutional landscape. Um, and so I, I think that the book is an attempt to really explain why, to substantiate the argument and to show people where this came from, why, how it happened, what strategies and tactics these activists have used over the past 50 years uh, to get in the position that they are today. Let's jump to high schools, mostly teacher certification. Maryland, Connecticut, and New York all require master's degrees. Good. Let's make sure the teacher really knows the material. What's wrong with that? It's this kind of credential inflation uh, that doesn't actually serve students. In many cases, it doesn't really serve teachers. Um, but but who it does serve is the permanent bureaucracy that operates as a cartel. You have to come to our education school. You have to purchase our master's degree. We now have guaranteed employment uh, because of this cartel-like structure enforced by the state. Um, and so, um, you know, there haven't even in Washington state, I think it's either passed or is pending uh, legislation that would require um, uh, daycare workers uh, to have college degrees. I mean, uh, you know, th these these are absurd. It doesn't uh, it doesn't there's no evidence that it contributes to greater teacher quality, to greater student outcomes. And so I would actually prefer to go the other way, um, saying that if you have a bachelor's degree in a subject area, um, let's say you're a you have a bachelor's degree in biology, you're automatically qualified uh, to teach biology in the K through 12 level from elementary school all the way up to high school. Um, and I'd like to have alternative certification methods so that we don't just keep funneling money to these totally captured and totally ineffective graduate schools of education, but we get people that are young, smart, excited, knowledgeable, they have a college degree, they have subject matter expertise into the classroom to teach. Um, and so states such as Florida, Arizona, and others are now reforming the teacher credentialing uh, laws. And this is one place where, of course, I agree with many of my libertarian friends, um, we should make it um, uh, uh, easier for smart, ambitious, capable people to teach our kids um, rather than sending them through the deadening and total captured graduate schools of education. Albert Einstein would not be allowed to teach physics or math in my state. <laughs> and, yeah. And what did Albert Einstein really know about math? I mean, it's absurd. And of course, you know, not everyone uh, teaching uh, elementary school uh, will rise to the level of an Einstein. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is very simple. If you have a college degree in math uh, from, let's say, a flagship state university, uh, you are capable and qualified to teach eighth graders, you know, geometry and algebra. Uh, you know, it, it, it isn't rocket science. And we've had a uh, great education in 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 in, our, in the past um, without all of these kind of credentials upon credentials upon credentials um, I, I'd like to really wipe out um, large numbers of these credentialing cartels um, because th they, they really don't serve anyone and what we're at it might, might as well abolish uh, teachers unions as well well yeah that would be good but uh, the teachers colleges would argue okay maybe you know math but we need to teach you how to teach and how to deal with kids yeah I, I mean it sounds nice in theory but but there have been you know multiple rigorous academic studies that show that um, these master's degrees and these kind of pedagogical trainings don't lead to any better student outcomes and so uh, if they were doing that, uh, and if they were achieving that, I would be open to a debate and a discussion. But the fact that even on their own terms, even using their own arguments, they fail to achieve it uh, signals to me that something else is going on and that they shouldn't be trusted. Um, and, and, and look, I think that the best thing for teachers to do to get training 
is to get into the classroom, uh, is to have that year of working under another teacher in the classroom training, working with colleagues, working with principal, working with other administrators, um, you know, perhaps doing some 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 reading or some or some study on pedagogical techniques. But in, in, in my experience, um, uh, you know, inside the classroom, outside the classroom, um, you know, teaching is a skill that is best learned by teaching. Uh, and, and I think that holds true across the board. Thank you, Chris Rufo. You're an unusual advocate in that you can take grief from some nasty people and you cheerfully argue back. So thank you for your time. <laughs> Hope to talk to you again. All right. Thank you. You still watching? I'm a little surprised. I built my whole career on shrinking news stories down to five minutes or 10 minutes because that's my attention span. But now I see that lots of you want more long interviews. So here are the most recent ones we've done. If you have suggestions for people I should interview in greater depth, tell us in the comments.